On behalf of Gnostic MYC, welcome everybody. Uh, Father Anthony, since his apologies, wasn't able to make it today. It's great to see so many new people. Uh, Gnostic NYC, for those of you who are new, uh, is an uh, interdenominational effort to establish a presence for Gnosticism. In New York City, we uh, present monthly lectures like this one. Uh, we also present monthly workshops on a variety of topics and practices. Um, in addition, we, we host rituals associated with different Gnostic churches. Uh, if you're interested, check us out online at GnosticNYC.com and check out our YouTube channel where we also host a weekly uh, discussion called Talk Gnosis. Um, all of our lectures and workshops are also available online. Um, today's uh, presentation is uh, one I've been looking forward to for quite some time. I've been a big fan of Jason's blog for uh, a long, long time, and um, I'm very pleased that he's agreed to come and speak to us. Um, I'm a, this is an example of, uh, of how important and significant I think this book is. Uh, I'm a member of, a, of, of various groups, but one group I'm, I belong to, uh, one of the members, having just finished the book, sent a note out to all the rest of us and said, you have to read this book. Drop what you're doing and read this. If you can't afford it, I will pay for you to get a copy of it. That's how important he thought this was. So um, with that introduction, I'm going to turn the floor over to, to Jason, and thank you for coming. Well, thank you for having me. Thank you for having me. So um, my name is Jason Miller, and I have a, a long background in occultism and, and magic and spirituality. That, um, I won't get into all the background and waste time with that. You can read about that stuff on my blog and online. But uh, I bring together various traditions from uh, Tibetan Buddhism and uh, Gnosticism and ceremonial magic and witchcraft. And like many of you, I've gotten around in the last 20 years or so and uh, have managed to make it sort of a cohesive thing. Uh, and brought it all together as a, a system that I call strategic sorcery. So, <clears throat> I'm the author of Protection and Reversal Magic and the Sorcerer's Secrets and the Strategic Sorcery course, but most recently, Financial Sorcery, which is what I'm here to talk about today. Now, this uh, topic is really important uh, for Gnosticism because really for any type of spirituality one of the main dilemmas that we're faced with is what the Gnostics would call holecticism. So I'm in a room full of Gnostics. What's holecticism? Anyone? Is it, is it when you say it's holecticism? Helecticism. Okay. Uh, helecticism would be materialism basically. Uh, Valentinius would have said that you know there are helectic people or helecticists, people that worship matter. There are psychics. And he didn't mean it in the sense of you know, kolminal uh, psychics. He meant it in the sense of uh, people that were overly heady and, and intellectual. And then there are people that are pneumaticists, spiritual. So what's that called again? Uh, helecticism. But you can just say material. I just, you know. It's just nice to know. Yeah, it's nice to know the words. Nice to know the fancy terms. But it's it's only good to know the fancy terms if you can also not use the fancy terms. I always say, like, if you have to use the fancy terms, then you probably don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> so you know, I'm here at a Gnostic thing. I thought I'd just bring out some of the Gnostic terms, but um, so you know, this idea of materialism versus spirit. How do we be how, how, do we be, how do we maintain ourselves as spiritual people in the material world? This is a dilemma shared by Gnostics and, and spiritual people everywhere, right? So there's really only a couple different routes to take. And uh, this dilemma was phrased nicely in the Gospels of uh, Mark and John, I forget which Gospels, but anyway, two of the Gospels, 
Uh, Christ is says you cannot serve both mammon and the Lord. And mammon, he's using uh, the word to denote money and wealth and so on. In fact, the word mammon has made its way into various languages uh, still to mean money. And you know he's right. You can't serve money and serve spirit. It doesn't work. And I think that most of us can look around the world today and see a lot of problems that are caused by people that are serving money without serving spirit or, or anything else from that matter, <laughs> common sense or, um, you know, just uh, the, the true, you know, we call them idiots, but like the true, the true meaning of the word idiot in Greece would be someone who has no sense of the common good. Mm -hmm. And so, in a way, they're idiots in the most true sense. That you're, you're serving money without any sense for the common, much less for the spirit. So, the most obvious thing, and, and the way that most religion, at least in the outer sense, tells you to solve this problem, is to renounce money, renounce the world. Now, Obviously, I wrote a book on financial sorcery. <laughs> but let me be clear. I think that this is a good way to go. I think that people that really renounce the world, that renounce money for, for spiritual practice, I think it's great. I really do. I, I know I've lived in Nepal, and, and uh, you know, I, I know monks and nuns that are Buddhists, and I know monks and nuns that are Catholic, and uh, they have my highest respect. I know wandering yogis that, um, you know, just basically are, are homeless mystics. My highest respect. Unfortunately, most of us are not willing to do that. And I don't think anyone in this room is probably willing to do that. I know I wasn't willing to do that. I had it off. Just do this. Um, I second that. Right. So, you know, I, that's not the way to go for me. So then this leaves us with a problem. Well, you know, we have this thing called money that we can't ignore. It's too powerful yeah. to just say, you know, I don't want to deal with it at all. It takes over your life. And we're also in a position where, for whatever reason, we don't want to or we don't feel compelled to or we don't feel able to renounce it fully and really renounce it. Now, there are those of us who kind of fool ourselves into halfway renouncing it. And I, this is my confession time, I was one of these people. Like a lot of magically oriented people in my 20s. You know, I was, I was 20 years old in 1990, and I was, in 90s parlance, would be a slacker. Lived in Philadelphia, had, you know, decent jobs. Good jobs by today's standards, but, you know, just kind of decent jobs, temp work, got in with AIG as an underwriter tech, and, you know, but didn't really care, man. I didn't care about my job. And I knew people who worked in coffee houses, and they were just like, you know, my real, you ask what they do, well, I'm, you know, an OTO person, or I'm a witch, or, it's a, you know, that's just what I do for money, you know? <coughs> so they have this sort of idea that they're renouncing money by just kind of barista spirituality, for lack of a better term. <laughs> it doesn't work, though doesn't because you get older and you know you pop out a few kids and suddenly it's a little more important or you just realize well you know I'm working 40 hours at Starbucks I could have been working 40 hours a week at Ernst & Young and making a heck of a lot more and have better vacation time so I would actually be able to do more of the spiritual stuff than I am working at Starbucks it's not to say Starbucks is anything if anyone works at Starbucks disclaimer Perfectly fine company, as far as I know. They take care of people, so, you know. I did it in the 90s. Right, yeah, well, the 90s was the time to do it, you know. But how many slackers find themselves in the 2000s? It's like, you know, in the 90s, 
if you could operate a computer, you'd get a fantastic job. Two thousand is just like, oh, you want to do data entry? Do you have a master's degree? <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, it's it's a different time. Um, so this barista spirituality, this half-assed renunciation. Can I curse? By the way. It's just encouraged. Foul language. It's encouraged. It's by the occasional <laughs> foul language. I, I have three-year-olds, two of them, so I don't get to curse at home. So when I'm out, I like to you know throw out a good curse and just get it out of my system. <laughs> um, <laughs> so anyway, the um, you know this this sort of half-assed barista spirituality it doesn't really work. It's not real renunciation. So when I was in Nepal, I, I was there and I was sort of looking around and looking at my life and like, well, I can go home and you know work maybe at the family hardware store and then come back next year and just do this ad and that. And it's like, you know, this is not the way to go. And I'm looking around at some of my heroes, people that you know wrote books and dedicated their lives to the Dharma, and they're like 60 years old and they're having a really difficult time getting health care and they're. They're having a really difficult time, uh, you know, with places to live. And the people that, that wrote the books that I read in the 80s about witchcraft and, and, and magic were now entering into their retirement ages and were having serious health issues and they would have to send out these calls for, you know, please help me, you know, I spent my life teaching witchcraft and nobody told me there wasn't a pension that came with that. <laughs> um, so I kind of said, well, screw that. <laughs> you know, there's got to be another way. So what do we do if we can't let something master us and we can't ignore it and renounce it altogether? We have to master money. You have to bend it over and spank it and make it your bitch. So that's what financial sorcery is about. Uh, in Buddhism, you know, we have, everyone's heard of Sutric Buddhism and Tantric Buddhism, mm -hmm. probably. So the idea there is, uh, Dujum Rinpoche used to say that it, the passions and, and, and poisons of the world are like a poisonous plant. And Sutric Buddhism teaches you to renounce the plant, to just avoid it and not go near it, or to antidote it in the case of a bodhisattva. But the Tantrika takes the plant and he uses it as part of the spiritual path. From that poison, he makes the medicine to antidote the poison. That's essentially the goal of financial sorcery. So that's what... I aim to do with the book. And, you know, I'm speaking in broad generalities about, you know, the stereotypical poor pagan and things like this. Obviously, there were pagans that are doing phenomenally well. There are, um, there are Gnostics that are doing phenomenally well. There are you know, people that are doing very well financially, and, and some people that were just born doing well. Like the old time occultists we were talking about earlier, you know, in the old days, not you know pre hippie era to be an occultist you you know most of them had trust funds that they were just wasting so um, so <clears throat> we as, as uh, people on the fringe of spirituality um, are are particularly adept at taking things that society as a whole or that mainstream religion calls sinful and bringing them on the path um, you know sex we tend to bring it on the path and make it a sacred thing. So we don't talk about the evils of sexuality so much as we do the benefits of sacred sexuality. We don't talk about the evils of freedom of expression so much as we do the benefits of freedom of expression, to be kinky or freaky or, you know, walk around in, a, you know, in, in funky robes or something. Um, spells and magic, the ability to uh, use unseen forces to influence reality or the minds of other people to whatever extent uh, you can. We talk about that in terms of how to do it and make it beneficial as opposed to, my God, it's evil. <laughs> um, and, you know, going with this theme, money needs to be the next frontier, the evils of money. Uh, need to be brought on the path and made part of 
what we do and brought into line with our spiritual views, or else those who are ruled by money uh, will have the sole sovereignty over them. And so uh, that's, you know, that is what we're doing here. Now, um, you know, we're, this is a one hour class, so I didn't, you know, some of my classes that I give are focused on a particular aspect of financial structure, like finding a job or um, starting a second business or uh, something like that, I mean, classes and, and something like that. But I thought that given the time frame that we have, the most beneficial thing to do would be to talk about some of the basic principles of financial sorcery. Because a lot of you already have your own practices, natural practices, spiritual practices. And you can bring these principles back to that and use it rather than the methods in the book. Or you could you know, buy the book and use the methods along with your uh, own methods to create. Uh, but the principles are the key thing. The principles are the most important thing. Because really, most people out there that I give talks to already know enough magic. And if they don't, they can go pick up Judica Eel's uh, wonderful book, 5,000 Spells. And then, you know what? You've got a book of 5,000 spells. And it's wonderful. Um, so, and, you know, it, it's great. But has anyone that practices magic ever been asked, well, you know, if magic is real, why aren't you rich? Why aren't, you know, <laughs> right? Right. Yes. So, you know, at first, like everybody else, I would blow that question off and, and say, you know, like, well, that's not what it's about. Oh, well, I have yeah. riches of the spirit. Yeah, I have riches of the spirit and things <laughs> like that. But after a while, like I said, I, after I had this sort of epiphany at the end of my 20s, I started to think, well, no, really. <laughs> It's actually kind of a good question if you get past the they don't know anything about what I'm doing kind of thing. If you, if you set your ego about what you're doing aside, it, it really is kind of a good question. If spells work. Why isn't the, the you know, why are we hosting this in Monaco? Um, <laughs> right, you know, that's what I'm saying. I, I want the next Starwood to be, you know, in Monaco. Um, so, the answer that I came up with is that people are largely applying the spells for the wrong reason. And by spells, I don't just mean things that people think of as spells. You know, for Catholics, to me, going to the local church and buying a St. Joseph Sell Your House kit, that's a spell. I don't care what you want to call it. <laughs> You're buying a statue to sell your house. It's not fundamentally different than anything else. Uh, getting a copy of favorite novenas for all occasions, flipping through the you know the table of contents, and it's set up like a spell book. It's like you know for curing cancer, for finding a job, for this, for that, for so on. You open it up. It's a wonderful book. I highly recommend anyone that works with the saints goes out and gets a copy. Of favorite novenas for all occasions. And it will tell you, you know, what saint, how many times to pray, you know, if there's some kind of acknowledgement of their work at the end. It's wonderful. Church approved. Um, so it's all, you know, it's all magic to me. Um, but we have to use it for the right things, and we have to have the right perspective to make it work. And once I set these principles in place in my life, lo and behold, it started to work. So, first thing is, how many people in this room consider yourselves rich or wealthy? <laughs> Not that many people. Okay. How many of you live in New York City? Almost everyone but me. I got news for you. <laughs> um, the, you're all the 1%. We're all the 1%. You know, we, we have this vocabulary now from Occupy Wall Street of the 99% and the 1%. Except on the world stage, we're all the 1%. If you make over $44,000 a year, 
you are in the top 1% income earners on planet Earth. If you make over $24,000 a year, and the guy at White Castle makes more than that, you're in the top 10%. So if the top 1% have a responsibility to the country, do the top 1% for the world have a responsibility to the world? It's sort of an interesting question. Very spiritual question. Right, it's a, it's a spiritual question. Um, so, now, when I wrote about this in The Sorcerer's Secret, somebody wrote out and said, oh, but, you know, sure, $44,000 is a lot if you live in Haiti, but it's not, no, 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 it's a one-world economy. It, it's a one-world economy. Yeah. Your money is based upon everything and everywhere else. If you're rich, you're rich. The reality is your $44,000 a year gets you a lot in Haiti, but you have to pay a lot more for potable water than you can be absolutely piss poor here and get drinkable water for free. Something that you know most of the planet doesn't have access to at all. They walk an hour to get drinkable water. Um, so, you know, to put it all into perspective, we are all in the same boat, and we are all at the top of the boat. Now, why do I mention this? Do I mention this because? I want you to be thankful for what you have. Yeah, it'd be nice to be thankful for what you have, but that's not why I mention it. Do I mention it because I want you to be guilty about what you have? Definitely not. In fact, if you if your goal is to be able to light cigars with hundred dollar bills and then bathe in a tub of champagne, I want you to have that. I want you to drive to the Pagan Festival and the Bugatti Veyron. I want you to, you know, just have it all, by all means. Go Bill Gates and, and, and just go none. That's not why. The reason that I'm talking about this perspective is purely from a practical, technical standpoint. And this is the first practical principle. We, either through prayer or evocation, we summon, say, we talk to the archangel Tzadkia, who traditionally is associated with the planet Jupiter. So, whether through prayer or evocation, we call upon Tzadkia. Tzadkia, come here at prayer. I'm wearing Jupiterian blue. Please come down. You know, I've lit the appropriate amount of candles and spoken your name the appropriate amount of time. So, you get Tzadkia's attention. And you say, what you want. Tzadkiel, make me rich! Tzadkiel has no perspective of what that means to you. Tzadkiel is looking at you and it's like, dude, you live in the most expensive place in the world and you have disposable income. What the fuck do you want? <laughs> really? Like, you're rich already. There you go. Okay, job done. Later. Um, that's not the strategic sorcery way of doing it. But it is the way that most people do it. Make me rich. Make me wealthy. Well, you know, from the archangel's perspective, you're already there. Um, no, but if you summon Tzadkiel and say, you know, Tzadkiel, I have this idea for, uh, you know, doing Reiki for mixed martial artists, uh, which is something I just went through a brainstorming session with a guy for. And I want this to bring in an extra $50,000 a year, you know, after the first two years. I want to have that consistently added to my email. That's something that Sadkiel can say, okay, we can probably make that happen. You know, that's not too far off. Because magic really does two things well. Well, three things if we count, you know, the spiritual illumination. But, <laughs> but uh, and, and that is, of course, you know, the most important thing. I'm, I don't mean to short shrift that. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm joking, because the whole thing is really about supporting that. But, again, you know, we have to have this... Uh, you know, if we're not going to renounce the Hellectic, then we have to bring it in line. So, 
Um, but it does three things well. It, it illuminates us spiritually. It affects the minds of other people. Which is uncomfortable if you're, you know, in the office and you know you get found out. There was recently uh, the Mumbai, no, the Mombasa News um, this week published an article about you know witches in the workplace and you know how the person that just got promoted, watch out if they have the same bag that's falling apart, it might be a magic bag. <laughs> so um, you know, people do get uncomfortable if they. You know, think that you're, you know, it's one thing to be a witch in the sense of I celebrate the holidays and worship the God of Gods. It's quite another thing to be a witch that's like, yeah, I found the powder that you put on my shoes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's a whole other, you know, strata of things. It's like, well, for the one, it's religious discrimination. For the other, <laughs> it's, uh, there's, a, there's a few more things at work there. Um, but, we have to, you know, it can get, the minds of other people can be affected. And probability can be affected with magic. It can be pushed this way and pushed that way. It can't be sort of picked up from here and dropped in over here. Um, I can't make it snow today. Well, maybe. So it is September, but um, it would be difficult to do so. Um, but, you know, to make it rain today would be significantly easier. So that's what I mean by probability can be affected, and this is why strategies are so important. So you summon Sadkiel and say, well, I have this plan, and I'd like you to support this plan by affecting the minds of other people and by pushing probability in my favor. Sadkiel sort of like, do no sweat. We can work with this, as opposed to. I want you to make me wealthy. <laughs> I'm so tired of dealing with money. Um, so that's you know your your first principle. Don't ask to be wealthy. Present a plan. Now, while we're talking about wealth. There is uh, a difference, if not an actual definition, in, in at least the definition of most people um, that do a little bit of financial planning or need financial planning books and things like that, between being rich and being wealthy. And it's important to understand the difference. Being rich is something that can be traced to income directly. So, um, you know, if you are making a half a million dollars a year, you're rich. However, if you are spending three quarters of a million dollars, you are not going to become wealthy. You are going to become poor, despite having this massive income. Although it's not really massive income for you, I guess it's sort of just like <laughs> um, you know, so wealth can be built on almost any income because no matter what kind of freaky economics people come up with, it all really boils down to the two piles of money. You have a pile of money coming in, whether you're a person or whether you're a country. You have a pile of money coming in and a pile of money going out. And if the pile of money coming in is bigger than the pile of money coming out, you are building wealth. If the pile of money going out is bigger than the pile of money coming in, you're building debt. VH1 built an industry of shows of people that had oodles and oodles of money but had larger debt than they had money coming in, and it was called Behind the Music. This week on Behind the Music, MC Hammer, he had it all, and now he's had to sell his mansion. Yeah. Uh, you know, Leonard Cohen has to tour at 76 years old, although he got ripped off. But um, Annie Leibovitz had to, um, you know, sell her, sell her sell art. Her you know, sell the, the rights to her art, not just her the art. Rights. She's had, had some rights. 
um, to our art to, to get by. So this is what I mean. Whereas, if you're the dude who works at the local hardware store and you manage to keep your expenses low by whatever means necessary and you come up with a way to increase your income, then you can build wealth. You have a little money set aside that you can then put into wise things or just stuff it in the mattress like drug money. And, might be the best thing to do these days. Who knows? <laughs> um, and uh, you know, you can build real wealth. And obviously, you don't want to. You know, if you're interested in financial sorcery, the idea is to have that level of stasis. But the point is, uh, rich versus wealthy. Um, What's uh, Buckminster Fuller?